Thanks for watching this Flame Guitars video. You join me today in my South London workshop. So what I have today, it's pretty obvious, is two Gibson Les Pauls, both with snapped off headstocks. And here are the, the headstocks for these guitars. Now for this guitar, the owner of this guitar was gigging with it, put it back in its case, got home, got the guitar out of his case a few days later and found to his horror that the headstock had just snapped off while sitting in its case. He doesn't think he dropped the case or suffered any, any form of distress whilst he was moving around, but I can well believe from my experience this might, might happen. The guitar can simply be in its case and the headstock has snapped off completely. He has actually brought me another Gibson Les Paul uh, with a damaged headstock. This is a more sort of classic break where just around this, this area here, the, the neck has sort of popped open and that one is, is uh, somewhat easier to repair, but rather unfortunate to have two Les Pauls, both with broken headstocks. Now, I wouldn't want to give the impression that my workshop is just filled with Les Pauls with broken headstocks. But it is true to say that over the last 10 years, the vast majority of the net repairs that I have carried out have been on Les Pauls. So it does beg the question, why is that? Why are these necks more likely to break than other type of guitars? Well, I could say you know, a lot about that, but if you were to look you know, primarily at the fact that Les Pauls are carved out of one piece of wood, which creates, I think, an inherent weakness in the grain structure around this part of the, the head, the neck. Uh, the thickness of the wood, when you, when you actually sort of look at, one, look, look at a, a broken headstock, you, you see that the thickness of the wood around the, the truss rod nut. You can, you can see how, how little, little strength there is there. Um, and there simply are just, just better ways of, of making a, a neck, you know, creating that neck angle whether that be by a laminated neck or a scarf joint. I just don't see guitars with broken necks with a scarf joint or a laminated neck just, just coming to the workshop for repair. So what's to be done? Can these guitars be repaired or are they beyond repair? Well, the good news is that yes, they can be repaired. It is quite a difficult and technical repair. It's a repair that I describe as, as not for the, the faint-hearted because it does require routing into the the back of the neck to strengthen this, this area around you know, where the, the crack has occurred because simply just gluing these, these two parts back together would, would not be sufficient, it would just pop open again. But I'll show you how I'd, I'm going to do that and at the end of this, this process these guitars will be back to uh, a playable condition and hopefully the owner will then have many years of enjoyment of being able to play these guitars again. So let's have a look at this neck break in a bit more detail. This grey part we're looking at here, and you can see the same on the front as well. So that's the, the fibre overlay, the fibre headstock overlay that the Gibson use. You can also see the, the truss rod nut there. And you know, maybe you can sort of pick up that sort of below the truss rod nut, there really isn't much sort of depth of wood there, just a, just a few millimetres. If I just, just gently put the parts together at this stage, because I don't want to sort of press at this stage of the repair. So this crack line, that's really typical of a Les Paul break. Mostly that they don't go all the way through. Sometimes they're just sort of hanging on by the, uh, by the, the uh, headstock fibre. This, this crack line is, is a bit more fractured than the most. Sometimes when you clamp them together, you can hardly see the, the, the crack line at all. You can just sort of see here where a little chunk of wood has, has come off and there and, and there and obviously the lacquer's come away as well. So the other Gibson Les Paul that we were looking at earlier, that has got a very clean break. Yeah, that, that'll come together quite well, whereas this is going to need a, a bit more work to get a, a good cosmetic finish in this one. But yeah, we can still do that. So thinking about the, the repair of this neck break, what I could do is just simply just glue these two parts back together. But because of the way this neck has, has broken, the actual sort of gluing surface between the two parts is not great. And so we, we've then, particularly on, on this side, 
gluing end grain to end grain, which is an in inherently weak repair. So what I've agreed with the owner of this guitar is I'm going to, once it's been glued back together, is insert two splints either side of the truss rod channel. And that's just going to sort of strengthen the neck around the, this neck break area. And then spray dark brown lacquer over the back of the headstock and sort of fade it into the, the neck. So it's going to change the look, but it will be a satisfactory repair. And is that compromise between sort of changing the look and, and actually, well, the alternative is to just glue it back together and hope for the best, which is, which is not ideal either. So compromises to be made, but at least we'll have a, a sound playable guitar at the end of the repair. So this is the gold top that, as you can see, has been glued back together. So let's have a look. You can see there, I just, just use a, a, a couple of cores which have, have got um, some cork added onto them just to protect the, the surface whilst I'm clamping. Okay, that looks great. Let me just uh, come in a bit closer. So here is the, the crack line running along there. You know, I wonder if the camera can even sort of pick it up. On a scale of Gibson neck brakes, this is about as clean as it gets. Just a little bit of loss of the finish there, which I can, which I can touch up, touch up. But yeah, that, that's very good. Very little cosmetic finishing needs to be done there. Let's have a look at the the front. Yeah, so on, on the headstock, the, the crack line is much more obvious running across here. A bit of excess glue to come off here. Uh, yeah, so what I need to do on this side is to infill along this, this crack line. And then just sort of sand that back and then overspray with some black lacquer. Uh, being black, it is much easier to disguise this, uh, this repair. So I'm pretty confident that actually this is going to look pretty close to perfect once this is done. Some years ago I had to uh, repair a neck where the neck had pretty much snapped in half. 
So there was no opportunity to clamp the two parts back together as I had done for these two Les Pauls. So I had to think about a way where I could apply some pressure end grain to end grain whilst the glue hardened and then also hold that guitar in place, hold the neck in place whilst I routed two splints into the neck. So I came up with this jig which I'm also going to use for routing the neck of one of these, these Gibsons. So let's have a look at this. So here is the jig. The neck sits along this part and the neck angle is set with this uh, sort of pivoting piece here uh, and that, that is held in place by the, this wedge which has allows me to, as I say, set the, the neck angle. If I need to apply pressure onto the headstock, I can do so by means of these wedges. So this part sits against the end of the headstock and then to apply pressure, I just simply just slide the wedges over each other and that allows me to control the amount of pressure I want to exert on the end of the headstock. The router sits on here and just allows me to control what I'm doing when it comes to routing. So this jig just allows me to stabilize everything, just hold it in place, apply, apply pressure if, if I need to, and importantly, just, just, just gives me sort of visibility when I'm a, when it comes to that, that delicate part of, of routing into the guitar neck. So as you can see, I've just made a couple of mahogany splints. These really are fiddly to make. Uh, just have to be done entirely by hand. And so what I'm looking for is a nice snug fit so that once they're inserted and glued in place, there's no gaps around or minimal gaps around the splints. But equally, if, if they were too tight when inserted and were sort of driven in, they would then push against this glue joint uh, and put that, that glue line under stress. They don't have to be particularly long. This is the weak area on a Les Paul. This is invariably where they, they crack. And so these, these splints are going across that weak area. And importantly, because the, the grain structure is running along the splints, it's different from the grain structure of the neck around it. So they're adding considerable strength to this area once they're glued in place. If this neck was painted black then I'd probably insert maple rather than mahogany splints, maple being denser and harder than mahogany and so adding additional strength in this area. So next job is to glue these in place and then once the glue is set and hardened shape the splints to the surrounding area of the neck.
The next thing I need to do is to stain these two splints so that they're a sort of similar colour to the neck. Uh, why do I need to do that? Well, to hide these splints completely, I would paint the, the back of the neck and, and the sides of the, the headstock a, a black colour and then shade that black into the brown of the neck and the splints would then not be seen at all. But the owner of this guitar has asked that I use a dark brown rather than a black. Uh, and so if I was to go straight on and spray dark brown over, over this area, these splints would, would be very, very obvious. So what I need to do is try and match that colour to the, the existing neck colour uh, before I put uh, fresh paint over this area. Now to do that I'm going to use a product called Glue Boost and these are sort of transparent tints and I'm going to add to the colour to, to try and get that, that colour which is then going to be mixed with CA glue or, or super glue. Why, why use that rather than just a wood stain? Well if I put a wood stain or a dye on these splints I think that colour is going to sort of seep in around the, the edges of the splints and just highlight the edges of the splints and it just make them in a sense more and more obvious. Whereas the, the CA glue, the tinted CA glue is going to sit more on the surface and not, not seep in and so I think we'll, we'll get a sort of a more even colour match between the existing wood and, and the new splints. The CA glue is also going to seal the wood and fill these pores in the mahogany. Uh, if, I, if I don't fill, fill the pores then when the, the paint is applied, the fresh paint is just going to over time seep into the pores of the wood uh, and just make the, the, the splints more obvious. So, let's uh, give this a go. So I've, I've tried earlier on today a, a couple of sort of colour matches and found that just adding the, what is this, this is the yeah, transparent brown, just using that alone produces quite a dark colour, even, even as I uh, sort of thinned it down. So on, on this, this mix, I'm just going to try the ti a tiny amount of the, the brown and an even smaller amount of the, the transparent amber, which I think may just help to give the right colour. I'd rather go at this stage for a too light colour rather than a too dark colour. Let's start by mixing in the brown. And drag in some of the amber. Okay, let's see. What that looks like. Yeah, the the amber has, has definitely helped. That's actually pretty good. I'll just thin that, that down just a little bit more. And make it not quite so strong. Let's try that. I'd rather just build this up in two or three layers than try and get the colour match perfect first time off. Yes, yeah, maybe just thin that down a little bit more. That's pretty good.
that's that's very good. Yeah, I like that. Okay, let's um, let's do this. Just going to use a brush to apply this, just so I can really get exactly where I want it. Colour matching is often not at all easy, but that's, that I think is pretty perfect. Yeah, well pleased with that. The next part of this repair, which is to touch up the, the crack line across the front face of the guitar and the headstock just allows me to use one of my favorite tools in my, in my workshop, which is this airbrush. Just love the control that this, this tool is able to give me. I'm able to get the application of the paint exactly where I want it with very, very little overspray. I can build this up in, in layers. Just the way that the paint is, is layered on means I have much less leveling to do once the, the paint has, has hardened and cured. I can just get sort of pinpoint accuracy where I'm wanting the paint to be applied. Yeah, just love using this tool. So much better than trying to do this, do this by hand with a brush. The brush inevitably means that you have you know, quite a lot of work to do to get it flat and level afterwards. So I'm just going to let that that dry for an hour, maybe, and then just just come come back and apply some more. I can just see that I've got a little little bit more filling to do, just in that area there. That's uh, just got a couple of divots there which I need to address. That area is looking very good. That's yeah, pretty good, and that side looking very good as well. So just just there, and just just ac across there. Uh, but yeah, this this should look pretty close to perfect once that's once the paint's all been applied. So I've let the the fresh paint harden overnight, and by applying paint, what it's done is exposed. There is a couple of indentations um, in the the finish, particularly just just there, which just became more apparent once I put some lacquer on. So I've just infilled those areas with a bit of super glue and then just level the whole area. Why super glue? Well, if I could carry on just, just painting over that with, with lacquer and it would cover those indentations, but over time the lacquer would progressively sink into the, the crack line and just expose those, those crack lines and those, those indentations, whereas super glue won't do that. It'll just sit on the, on the surface, so to, so to speak. So super glue is a much better area. So I'm now ready just to go and apply some more paint over these two headstocks. Um, as I've done the flapping, it's, it's now not quite so clear where the crack lines were. I think it was across there and diagonally across there. Uh, but I guess that's good that um, I'm starting to, to not be able to see so clearly where the crack lines were at all.
This is the, the gold top Les Paul. Now this had a sort of matte black, satin mac, a black finish. And I sprayed some black lacquer across the crack area. And now my intention was to cut that back and blend it into the, the existing finish. But when I started to do that, the transition between the, the new and the old just, just didn't look natural. So I then sprayed clear lacquer over the entirety of the, the headstock and had a conversation with the owners of this guitar about how we would then finish this. And his pref preference was for this to be finished with a, a gloss finish, which is what you see on you know, nearly all, all Les Paul. So that, that's, that's great, it's gonna look, look very natural. So now I'm just gonna cut back the lacquer, just go through a number of grits and polish this up to high gloss. So I decided in the end not to film the, the spraying of the lacquer of the back of the headstock. I was just concerned about some lacquer floating around and getting on the lens of my camera. But I think you can see what I've done so far. So I've used a nitrocellulose lacquer, which so nitrocellulose is used on the, the rest of the guitar. Uh, and to that, that nitrocellulose, I've just added some trans tint dye. This is uh, medium brown. This is from Stu Mac in, in America just to colour the, the lacquer. And yeah, this is going well so far. So I've just started with um, a light, as light a brown as possible, just to progressively add darkness as I go along. Because what I want to do is not go too dark at this stage, um, so that I've added as little brown as, as possible. And uh, you can see that the, the two splints are starting to be obscured. And the judgment I have to make is to what extent do I carry on adding a brown over the back of the, the headstock and around the, the two splint area so that these two splints are sort of pretty much totally obscured but therefore having quite a contrast between in effect the, the two browns or do I just accept that these splints are going to be slightly visible and therefore um, add less brown to the back of the headstock. So that, that's a judgment to be made. I think I am going to add some, some more colour to the back of the headstock and the, the, the splint area. Uh, but yeah, so far this is, this is going well. I'm sort of pleased with, with how the, the splints are, are starting to be far less noticeable.
So here is the, the finished headstock. And just going back over what I've done, so I've sprayed black lacquer over this, this area here, and then sprayed clear lacquer across the, the whole of the, the headstock, then cut it back and, and polish as you saw. And that's gone very well. I think, I think the crack was across there, but even sort of catching this in the light, it's quite, yeah, it's really hard to detect where that was. So yeah, very pleased with how that, that's gone. Certainly from the front, you'd, well, there is no evidence to, to suggest this neck has, has suffered a neck break. So here is the finished repair to the, the back of the neck. I don't know if the camera can pick this out, but that's where the, the two splints are. And the question in my mind when I was coming to spray lacquer over the back of the headstock and down into the, the splint area was how dark I make the lacquer. Too dark and the serial number and the made in USA stamps would be lost completely. Too light and the, the two splints would be quite obvious. So that was always the compromise, the question in my mind. Um, and until the, the clear lacquer is applied and it's all polished out, you never know quite how, how dark or light that brown lacquer is actually going to be once it's all polished out. But this was a very severe net break and there's always compromises to be made between changing the, the original look of the guitar and a successful repair. What we now have is uh, a stronger neck. This neck is not going to break in the future. So yeah, I'm happy with how this has all turned out. So here are two ways to repair a guitar that has a broken headstock, snapped off headstock. With regards to this one, the gold top, I've glued it back together and then refinished the headstock. The same for this one, but I've also inserted splints around the, the crack area. The owner of this one, I talked about inserting splints with him and his preference was to, to not go, go with that and in a sense take, take a chance that actually this, this neck may crack again. And so I guess the question is which technique is, is appropriate for what type of, of neck break? Well, what I would say is that the, the more the crack is along the line of the grain, sort of more running that way, the more likely it is that uh, gluing back together will be successful. And the more the crack is across the grain, more at 90 degrees to the fretboard, then you're trying to glue end grain to end grain. And that is inherently weak. It's unlikely to last for very long if it's glued back together. And therefore you need to find some means of strengthening that crack area in the way that I have done here. So thanks for watching this. Phil, please feel free to ask me any questions or drop me a comment as long as it's a, a nice comment. But thanks for watching this Flame Guitars video.